Thanks very much, Ian. Yes, good afternoon and welcome to Lunchtime Live with me, Rosa Stengo. Over the next 20 minutes, we're going to be talking about the gradual move towards a cashless society, something the pandemic has perhaps brought into sharp focus. But are we ready for cashless and what are the challenges ahead? Joining me in the studio today to talk about these uh, banker Marvin Cartwright and together Gibraltar spokesperson Daniel Gio. Gentlemen, thank you very much. For joining me. Good Thank afternoon, Ross. Okay, so let's uh, let's just quickly point out to you that in Spain, uh, picked up a news article the other day saying that the Spanish government has got plans to cash, cut pa- cash payments and gradually eliminate cash to move towards a cashless society. That's actually going to be discussed in Congress. So let's talk about what's happening here in Gibraltar because um, cashless does seem to be the way we are going. Marvin. Absolutely. And the direction of travel is irreversible. Uh, interestingly, the, the, the point you made about Spain, it's, I think, the second or third uh, reduction that they've, they're, they're implementing. Uh, the dynamics of Spain are slightly different because there's a large what we call B-money sector where there's a lot of transactions still undertaken with cash. And uh, clearly it's, there's a benefit in terms of revenues to governments, etc. in that regard. But importantly, from, a, from an online sort of cashless society perspective, we have to go that way. It's efficient, it's economically more friendly, it's more secure, and uh, therefore there's only one way to go. There are some drawbacks. We'll get into that a little bit later on. Daniel Gill, what are your thoughts? Um, I share the same sentiment as, as, as uh, Marvin, because at the end of the day, we live in a modern world where computers, IT, smartphones have overtaken our day-to-day living. We can literally work pay, do everything over a little smartphone nowadays. And I understand the, the precaution that the elderly people may have because they, they, they're, not tech, they're not tech savvy enough. Many people are technophobes. They are scared of technology. They're scared of new technologies. And people just don't know how to handle that idea of online and cashless. And, you know, people want something physical in their hands. Um, well, I'm, you're, not, you're not going to change that, though, are you? No, you're not. So, so I, I, I believe it's the best approach to take is a hybrid approach. You can't force everyone overnight to just go cashless. You have to sort of meet in the middle, still provide the old school services, have counters of people being able to go pay cash and also sort of grow your online sort of systems and be able to be at home, myself, yourself or Marvin, and do your ID card renewal forms and pay your all your bills that change your direct debits and basically do everything that took time out of your life, even time of work, to go out to town, to the banks, to, to government counters and be able to just do everything up at home. Well, let's talk about government counters. We know that they are closed at the moment and uh, this is, uh, you know, the new way forward that they want all the services to go online. So let me just ask you, what are your experiences of eGov and online here in Gibraltar? Is it strong enough? Is it ready to support cashless? Marvin? No, it's not. Um, The government made a a big commitment towards eGov. I think they'd recognise themselves that it's not quite gone on the sort of timing of progress that they'd have liked, uh, but that commitment remains. Uh, uh, very interestingly, I had the experience only a couple of weeks ago with the, with, with the opening of the border to, I didn't have an ID card, I'd lost it. I assumed I wouldn't need one again given Brexit, <laughs> but uh, I therefore had to apply. I had to, I had to fill in the forms uh, which are available online. However, then came payment and, you know, the, the nuggets of, you know, you can come and pay by cheque or you can fill in a form. <laughs> Does anyone your... use checks anymore? I think if, if you look at the retail banks now, I mean, and again, Gibraltar's slightly behind the curve here. I mean, we all know from going to the UK, you, you, you just, I mean, it's practically non-existent as, as far as retail transactions exist in the UK now. So your um, options were check? Well, to fill in a form and hand that in with my card details on the form into probably a relatively insecure Magic uh, box. <laughs> post box, I think mm. it was. Let me just ask you about that, because the form, the online form, apart from the fact it does slightly defeat, doesn't it, the, the, the point of online if you actually then have to physically go mm. there. Correct. How secure is it to write your card details on a form like, the, like they ask you and then just put it in a letterbox as a banker? Is that something that you would recommend? No. That I mean, it. OK, but uh, Daniel, your <laughs> thoughts on that as well? Um does well, the, that concern the, you? The, the, the card details of the whole government. Well, thing. does it concern you having to write, you know, your card yeah, details yeah, on course. a piece of paper and then putting in a post box? That, that probably contradicts every single GDPR regulation, <laughs> modern sort of nowadays. That you know, 
it, it's it's insane because it, it's it's a box that's I think in, in Sir Joshua Hassan lobby, and, and yeah, there might be a security guard, but you know. Stuff can happen. Stuff can go missing. We and... do often give our credit card, card details out to people on the phone, uh, online, constantly, don't we? Is there a difference between doing that and on, putting it in a letterbox? On, online, you have the, the security encryption factor. So if, if you're doing a transaction on an online, well-known, relatively safe website, you're fine. You know, millions of transactions happen every day on Amazon, eBay, PayPal, and every single big global sort of a payment provider. But the moment you sort of put paper, put your details and put it in a box, if that box goes missing, all his details and everyone else's details could be yeah. used for fraud, could be used for, for anything. Look, it's, it's not risk secure. free. No. It's not risk free. Never but, is. But, um, but at the end of the day, as I said before, this is the direction of travel. It can only become more efficient, more secure, more options of payment, smarter. And this goes back to what your original question was on the e-government stuff. When they launched the ID card that we have today, which was a so-called state-of-the-art ID card, this was back in 2015. It was supposed to be like the the magic sort of chip in the whole e-government system. It was one card that you'd use for every single government platform. You know how nowadays you go to every single government mm. counter and you have a unique ID for that place, a unique ID for your car, a unique ID for your I, for your ID, which is logically what should be your your, your number. You know your, the the personal number at the back, that should be applicable to every single government department. Yeah. And there is no sort of backbone in the in, in, in the present e-government website which allows you to to use any of that technology. I remember technology. Um, putting a question to the Chief Minister about e-gov and everything, and it's, it's clearly a very complex thing, isn't okay. it? Of course. You yeah, know, yeah. I, I don't know if any country has it down to a T, yes. do they? Yes, if you look at Estonia, they, they invested quite heavily into make, making government, e-government a painless thing for everyone you can actually go online today and create a company in estonia from the comfort of your own home it's some weird eu thing that allows you to go in there create a company and, and run it as, as if you're in estonia but that's there you can do that today hmm. that what's interesting is that i looked at the housing application um on on egov and you can actually pay your rent directly online using worldplay so it's not as though you can't pay because no. i've heard it said that you can't pay government no, you online you seem to be able to be able to do it on some services and not others is that... the, the, i just feel there's no cohesive sort of joint thinking in the whole e-government platform so if you're going to um, have an e-government website where all you're doing is placing forms online that's basically the same thing as going to the ID office or whichever other government counter, taking the form home, print, filling it in, taking it in. The, the whole process needs to be sort of put into e-government. So if, if we roll out this whole sort of like um, cashless idea or, or, or doing everything online idea, what I spoke about before, like the hybrid solution, you'd have the ID office as an example. You'd have a, a tablet, an iPad or whatever, like, where people can come down, the elderly and the, the the civil servant can guide them through the process of filling in the details to, to get their ID card. In Spain, if you if you do an appointment for your ID card or passport, you go there and then, whatever time they give you, you sit down, they process all the information, and you leave that 30 minutes later with your passport and ID card. There's a, a, a three-week wait at the moment for ID cards. Or more, yeah. Yeah, I think there was a sudden influx, wasn't it? And it caught them but the only reason, unawares. The, and... the only reason for that is because you are going from paper Going back into government counters, then that paper needs to get processed. That pro process needs to be, uh, be input into a database. Then that needs to be printed. Mm. Then someone needs to go pick up the, like, the yeah. card. It's just a full-on archaic process, which should be modernized by now. And, and apparently the state-of-the-art ID card was the beginning of that. Mm. But five years later, we're still waiting for, for more e-government so, stuff. So in your opinions, we're definitely not ready with e-gov to, to go cashless. The, there's a long right? way to go. Right. The, the, yeah. Yeah. Now, a big demographic, you mentioned the elderly, they are a big demographic, course, yeah. okay? And uh, I know together you brought a, a putting a question in Parliament uh, about the sort of yes. support that the government might possibly uh, offer. But um, I, I'd like to play a couple of clips from some senior citizens who are quite happy to share their thoughts with me. This is Manolo on, um, on whether he still prefers cash or not. Many do. And not only do they like to do it, it's good for them to do it, that they leave the house and they walk a quarter of a mile, half a mile or two meters, whatever. It is good that seniors just come out of their houses and walk and interact with others. And uh, this is Olga. I can understand why bright young people in banking want to get rid of cash, but 
uh, I don't want to put in a plea for senior citizens, uh, given that that's my age group now. Um, many seniors are computer literate, but many are not. And the big problem is failing eyesight. Uh, I was diagnosed myself with, with um, macular degeneration and cataracts some time back. And apparently there are many people with those ailments. And you cannot trust blurred images you see when you try to concentrate on numbers and words on your computer or your mobile. Uh, who wants to risk getting that sort of information wrong? It's very difficult, isn't it, uh, for the older mm -hmm. generation? And actually, I have a clip from Manolo about what he thinks about um, online and, and having to use computers. So look, at one time, many people were literalists. And we had to devise ways and means so that people could lead a normal life. It's the same thing with, with, with uh, this new fan gold. Everything must be online. Everything must be direct debit. This is okay for 20 and 30 year olds, but not for the elderly. The elderly will just not understand and refuse to understand. Many are set in their ways and they will not tolerate change. They say, why should I change? For the last two weeks or so, I've been talking to ever so many people. This morning I was talking to two. One was telling me he has no computer and why should he buy one? I am not interested. I do not want one. But government is doing things their way, which more or less forces me to buy one. Now, um, we can't ignore the difficulties faced by a certain demographic, uh, demographic. If we're lucky enough, we'll be there one day. What can we do to help you know, the senior citizens in this world that is is being pushed towards cashless. Uh, we heard Manolo talk about the importance of being able to go out and get cash. And Marvin, I know your experience as a banker is that older people do prefer to deal with cash. So how do we overcome this? Well, I think, look, look um, with the exception of medical reasons, I, I don't think any of Manolo's, with respect to Manolo, the, the arguments he's put forward are are a reason for preventing the progress of a cashless society. Exercise can be done for many reasons. It doesn't need to be associated with paying a bill. Um, and I think also when you look at the demographic, what is elderly? Is it from the age of 60? 60? 60-year-olds um, in the last generation would have thought it very foreign when they looked at iPads, iPhones, etc., uh, 4G TVs, smart TVs. The 60-year-old today, actually, in the main, are quite comfortable with that sort of equipment, and they're familiarising. So it's not true to say, broad brush, that every elderly person cannot adapt or is unwilling to change. Well, maybe, um, you know, 60s, uh, the new 50s or 40s. Uh, this is Albert, Albert, who is in his 60s, and this is what he had to say. I'm 66 and I go with the times, you know. I, I use Revolut, I use my debit card, my credit card. And I do a lot of shopping online. Uh, it comes to the point that I have less and less cash on me when I go out. In fact, sometimes not even a penny on me. I mean, I, I trust the security um, that I'm guaranteed. And so far, I haven't had any problems. So um, I am all for cashless, you know, going around without any money in the pocket. 60s, it's so convenient. 60s, possibly still up for doing all the online banking. But, you know, the elderly citizens like Manolo who don't like it, don't want computers or whatever, what, what is the solution for them? It's, it's, it's weird because some people are dead set in their ways and they won't change. You know, these people are, have lived a very different life. They, they come from a previous generation. And, you know, giving them an iPad or an iPhone to them, they, they don't want anything to do with it. Some, like, like this gentleman, have adapted. They use Revolut. They, they're happy to learn. Some are just completely scared. It, it, it's, it's a reality. People are scared of technology because they think they're going to break something. And in my experience, dealing with a lot of people in IT and dealing with people who, who, who don't understand how computers work or what you do with them, people are just scared. They see an error and all of a sudden, what do I do now? They so panic. what do you do? Do you give you them educate. more help? You educate. Yes. You, know, you, you educate. You provide classes even for the elderly. I think that Gibraltar College used to or does still provide classes for the elderly. And then in, in, in businesses and, and sort of like government counters, you have a hybrid solution where... People can walk in, as they have always done, because the elderly generation, that's what they like. They like el cafelito por la mañana en el pueblo, go meet up with their friends, go down to town, go to, to, to the bank, pay, cash out, whatever they need to do. Do those, do those little things, which to them is part of their routine, um, daily routines. If, if you still, 
if you close those doors, yeah, people are going to react in a very, you are stopping us from, from living the life that we want to live and how we've been so used to for the last 50, 60 years. I'm aware, for example, that NatWest have dedicated um, service service staff who are there to assist, uh, doesn't need to be elderly, it could be anybody, Anyone, yeah, of course. Uh, in, in adapting and understanding how to use their online systems, for example, to encourage that usage. Um, is there quite a take up on that, do you think? I, I think there is. I mean, I, I, I no longer work for NatWest, so I'm not sure what, what the data would suggest. But I, I th- as I said at, from the outset, this is the direction of travel. Mm. We have to empathise with the cases, but I, I don't think that all elderly are reluctant or resistant to change. I believe there will be a natural change. And if we have this conversation in 30 years' time with the next generation of elderly, I don't think we'll be having the same debate. So it's it's going that way. Let's help those that can't, and I'm sure that they'll be, you know, it'll be, it'll be good for them too. Let, think, let me, sorry, I'm, I'm going to yeah. ask because time is pushing on. Let me ask you about card limits because um, somebody I know tried to buy a pair of earrings for £4.90 in Main Street and um, the shop wasn't taking cash because of the pandemic for hygiene reasons. And um, so she said, OK, no problem, I'll pay with a card. And she said, well, no, because it's below £5. So... My friend said, well, round it up to five pounds then. And she said, no, I can't do that. Um, Can you choose something else to buy? And my friend said, well, no, I don't want to buy anything else. I just want these four pound 90 earrings. And um, they weren't able to come to an agreement. um, So she had to not buy the earrings. Now, that's a bit sounds like a bit of a ridiculous situation. Why is it that I can buy coffee in some places and tap my card for one pound 50, but other places insist on on a limit? Marvin, can you explain that? Well, in the UK now, I travel regularly on business to London and, you know, I pay for a coffee with my phone. Uh, The problem in Gibraltar is, you know, when I go to a Just Eat or or a Costa Coffee, they've negotiated with the card acquirers deals for transaction charges. So, you know, the the problem maybe that some retailers have here that they don't have that that, uh, power of negotiation because they're small, uh, small businesses. And therefore... Transaction charges, if it's a Visa debit card, for example, could could cost 40, 50 P to the retailer. And if they're selling an item that's low value, that eats away their profit. So that is the reason behind it. The way to deal with that is either negotiate. I'm sure that the, the card acquirers are already reducing their costs to negotiate stronger. But also you can factor in that cost into your profit margin and your retail price. Uh, the, the example you've given, the irony of it is, is that sh- that shop lost the trade, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and my friend didn't have the earrings that she wanted. Uh, let me just ask you finally about security. How A lot of people have security concerns about online. If, if I can just get your final thoughts on, you know, security and, uh, you know, where you think that we will be, let's say, this time next year. I, I think security has always been part of, the fear factor no, of online and, and, and shopping online. And I'm 31, so I've grown up on the internet. I've seen the internet evolve from chat rooms to all of a sudden a bookstore, which is now Amazon, which sells literally anything and everything. And I used to have conversations with people. I was buying avidly online when my parents used to allow me uh, from a very young age. And I would talk to my friends or their parents. No, no, I'm not buying online. I'm scared. You know, they're going to they're gonna steal my card details because everyone's brainwashed this idea that, you know, there's a secret hacker just targeting you trying mm. to get your details. It's it's a big bad world out there, don't get me wrong, it is. But as long as it's easy for me to say because I've grown up in that environment that you apply common sense in where you're shopping and what you're doing and how you're doing it, looking for the little signs that you're on a, on a, on a padlocked website with the SSL certificate. These are things that I, as a pe- person with passion to technology, understand. But it's something that we should also teach people who are, who are not in, in that sort of world. Okay, thank you very much, Marvin. I think, look, I, I hear the message of the elderly. Uh, look, um, my, my 13-year-old daughter thinks I'm not tech savvy. So this is the way it evolves, right? Um, we should look at some countries and, and maybe learn from experiences of how the, those um, have adapted because in Northern Europe today, there's hardly any cash transactions and there's certainly not checks being paid for, for everything that you do. So... That's where it's gone. I'm sure there are elderly in those countries that were reluctant to change. Let's learn from those experiences and, and help our elderly adapt. Uh, because as I said, that's, this is uh, good for society that we remove cash mm. and become a, 
a cashless society. Um, Gen- oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to have to end it there. <laughs> it's a really interesting debate. Thank you very much for coming in and speaking to uh, me about it. Marvin Cartwright, Daniel Gill, you've been listening to Lunchtime Live on Radio Gibraltar.